Chloe and Charlotte do a great job with children's ministry, and if you wanted to be a part of that, it's, uh, it's an awesome ministry to be a part of. Uh, we've been doing men's barbecues on Monday nights. The last one is tomorrow night, so if you haven't been, come on out tomorrow night. Uh, I think it's 6.30, and you get some food, and we're going to talk about sort of the duties of a man, father, husband, brother, those kinds of things. But several weeks ago, we talked about vocation. And so I was sitting around a table, Jim Lanann was part of that, LJ Stogsdale, I'm not sure where he is, Uh, and there was, I think, five or six of us around the table, and we were talking about our first jobs. And for several of us, our first job was a paper boy. Anybody else in here, you you were a paper boy at one time? Yes, so I delivered the Orange County Register, and they would drop off a pallet of papers, and I would fold those papers, stick a rubber band around them, stuff them in my bags, and then hang the bags over the handlebars, and then go riding around. It takes a little bit to get used to the papers on the front, and then the beginning, you got to stop the bike, take the paper out, and throw it. And then as you get better, you can do it while you're riding, pull the paper out, and throw it. But then there's that Sunday paper. That Sunday paper with all the ads, you'd have to work to fold that thing in half, and you'd get it folded in half, and you'd have to use thicker rubber bands on Sunday around that thing, and you'd have to make several trips back home to load the papers into your bags. It was heavy, and it was shaking. I think the first time I threw a Sunday paper, I took off somebody's antenna. That was a shame-filled walk to the door to admit that I had knocked off their antenna. And it's early, too. It's like 5.30 in the morning, and you got to admit that. But as bad as that was, I think there was more shame at the end of the month having to go collect the money. I mean, this was before people paid online and did all that. And here I am, 12 years old, and I'd have to go ask people for money. And there were some people who would actually give me a hard time about giving me $2.25 to pay for their paper. And be like, seriously? And so you just go up there just with fear and trepidation, knock on the door and have to ask for the money for the month. And then there were other people who were fantastic. They'd already have it in an envelope and they'd give you a cookie or some sort of goodie, invite you in and hand you that. And it was just great. But I just remember the feeling of, it was like embarrassment to have to ask somebody for money and to go up there. It was really good for me to have to do that. But it was, in one sense, it was shame. I felt shame having to go collect money at the end of the month as a paper boy. Well, in the West, that's the way that we think about shame. Uh, This is sort of a, a, we think of shame on the one side, and the opposite of shame in our culture is self-esteem, that we feel good about ourselves. Do we feel good about ourselves, or do we feel bad about ourselves? And that's kind of the spectrum of the way shame works in the West. Let me read you how one psychologist uh, defines this. He writes, shame in this context describes an inner sense of unworthiness, often rooted in trauma and embarrassing experiences. Though real, this sort of shame is psychological and deeply interior. So when we think of shame in our culture, our tendency is to think of shame as something inside, how I feel about myself and the feelings that are going on inside me. But when we think about other cultures, especially Eastern cultures and Mid-Eastern cultures and ancient Near Eastern cultures, which is the context of the Bible, there's a different opposite to shame. On one side, you have shame, and on the other side, you have honor, and it has nothing to do with how you feel inside. So for example, in our culture, we could have somebody who's very honored in their profession, somebody who might be a very successful businessman, like top of the world, but they could still inside feel shame. They could be honored by everybody in their company, everybody in their field and industry, but inside they could still feel shame, and we would say we would put that person in the category of shame. In the ancient world, and in Eastern cultures even today, it has nothing to do with how you're feeling on the inside. It has to do with whether you're honored or shamed by the people around you, by the group around you. And the same psychologist defines it this way. He says, you know you are good or bad by what your community says about you. So it's a totally external thing. And so today, when we look at a passage where Paul is encouraging Timothy not to feel shame, not to be ashamed of this message, of this gospel, he's doing it and he's thinking, Timothy, you're going to be ostracized from the community in Ephesus, but don't worry about that. 
Don't worry if you're not honored by the people in Ephesus. It's okay to be shamed by them because you will be honored by the king when you step into his kingdom. And so this is what we're going to see today. We're going to see that, that there is a new reality. This, this scale has been obliterated by this new reality that God has brought in with the gospel. And while the gospel takes everything away, actually, it doesn't really obliterate as much as it flip-flops so that there's a new community to care about where you're honored and the people who are honored in this community are different than the other ones. And the shame doesn't need to be there anymore. It's just gone. So we just kind of have that bottom quadrant honor. But all of us know and all of us have experienced, even though we know the new reality, we experience the new reality, we're still susceptible to being driven by fear and shame. We still feel that. And we're going to talk about that, and then we'll conclude why we don't have to be that way, why we don't have to be driven by fear and shame, but we can be driven by something else. So open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy. It's on page 8, 994 in the Bibles under your chairs. 2 Timothy, and the first thing, again, we're going to see is God has created this new reality where this stuff doesn't matter anymore, and then we're going to see uh, why God did that and why we don't need to be susceptible to fear and shame anymore. Now, what I've done on the overhead here is I've put the passage uh, a little different than you would read it as you read verses 8 through 18, and the reason is because Paul's logic kind of meanders a little bit. And so what I've tried to do is put it more in thought order, and then when we get to the end of the passage, we'll actually look in your Bibles and read the last few verses uh, together. But the beginning here, uh, the way that uh, Paul writes, this is what God has done. This is the new reality that he's created. It says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now let's talk first about the gospel, because the gospel gets a lot of airtime today, which is great. It's awesome that the gospel gets a lot of airtime. But I think a lot of times when people talk about the gospel, they're actually talking about the implications of the gospel rather than the gospel itself. Here's what the gospel is. This is the most clear definition of the gospel Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Longest single chapter, single chapter in the Bible devoted to the gospel, and Paul sums it up this way. It's the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel, that Jesus died on a cross because of us and for us. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. That's the gospel. And so when Paul writes here, he says, um, the light to light through the gospel, this gospel message, this resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's this new reality because he was raised from the dead. And so let's start at the beginning. What is this new reality? God has saved us. When we think of that, when we read that, I think our first reaction is to think God has saved us from, anyone? It's okay to cuss in church. Hell. Hell. God has saved us from hell. Like that's what we naturally think, that God has saved us from his judgment, from his wrath, and that is certainly true. God has saved us. But when Paul talks about God has saved us, there's much more to that. God has saved us in the sense that we are no longer judged for our sins. We're not under his wrath because of our sins. So if you are here today and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and was raised from the dead, you are forgiven. You are saved. You have been saved. And I hope that for most of you, if not all of you, you had that moment where you just felt the conviction of your sins. Like for the first time, you just knew you were a sinner, that you had sinned against God. Like you just knew. I think a lot of times we feel that guilt a little bit, but for me, there was just that moment where I just, ugh, I am a sinner. And then all of a sudden, the light went on. It was like the truth that Jesus died for my sins and was raised from the dead. And it was like, the, literally, I felt like there was a weight lifted. I was saved from my sins. I was saved from the wrath of God. That was, that was my salvation. We call that justification is the theological term. 
but then I'm also being saved in the present. So we had a busload of kids, I think over 50, that went up to Hume this morning. We prayed before they left that some of them would experience that salvation, that they would experience their uh, forgiveness of sins, that weight lifted, and they just know that they are safe and sound before God because of what Christ did. And they're going to come back from the mountain, and the rest of their life, they are going to be awesome followers of Jesus. Isn't that your story? <laughs> Probably not, huh? No, and that's the being saved. Like, our Christian life is filled with ebbs and flows, and just kind of like this. Hopefully, you know, over the course of your life, there's a trajectory that gets higher, but there's ups and downs along the way. And that's why we're being saved. The term we use is sanctification. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. So that at 15, when I get saved at camp, I come back and I'm awesome for a week, maybe two weeks. I keep reading my Bible and then I just sort of get back to school, maybe start hanging out with some of the same friends that kind of motivated me to do the same things. But then something happens at youth group or conversation with, Pastor Mark or Ryan, and you just kind of have those ebbs and flows. But at 45, I would hope that I could say I'm more mature and I'm more like Jesus today than I was when I was 15. And then you're going to be 75. And if I ask any 75 year old in here, do you still struggle with sin? Do you still sin? The answer is going to be yes. But hopefully less so than when they were 45 because that trajectory, but they're still at 75, they still have that sinfulness. They still live in a sinful world until one day they will die and they will be raised again and they will be glorified. That's sort of the future salvation that we can look forward to. Resurrected bodies, no sin, no wrongs, no problems in the world because we've been glorified. We've been made like Jesus. So we were saved Nothing can happen. Once you're saved, it's taken care of. We are being saved. We're growing more and more like Jesus, and we will be saved. We will fully and finally be like Jesus in our glorified, resurrected bodies in a perfect world. That's our self. This is what God has done. This is because of the gospel, we have been saved. God saved us, but he didn't just save us. Look at that next phrase. He called us to a holy calling. He didn't just save us so we could be good with him. He saved us so that we could be part of something in this world and part of little pieces in this grand story that God is writing of redemption for both people and this world. And we get the opportunity to be a part of that. I think one of the reasons why teenagers are so addicted to phones and screens, whether it's movies or video games, is because their souls are bored. They don't understand this sense of calling that we have. And frankly, the reason we're addicted to our phones and screens and video games as adults is because we don't know what we've been called to. We don't understand that we're a part of something that goes into eternity. This is the opportunity we have. God doesn't just save us, but he moves us. He calls us to something holy, which is set apart. He removes us from the life we were living and puts us into this story of redemption that we get to be a part of. We're set apart. We are sons and daughters of the king. If you're a son or a daughter of the king, you have a responsibility to the kingdom, don't you? That's the calling we've been given. We have not only the opportunity, but a responsibility to carry out this calling, this mission that God has given us. So we've been saved, called to a holy calling, and then Paul gives us a little explanation, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Christ came, he died, he was resurrected, we know all that, and then it says, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Who abolished death and brought Immortal life and immortality. I think I've always known that. I mean, Jesus rose from the dead, and so we will rise from the dead. Like, I got that. But this week, as I was studying this passage and thinking about it, especially in the context of Timothy and Ephesus, there was some, it just kind of rang truer 
in a sense. It kind of hit me in a slightly different way, and here's what I mean, especially in the context of honor and shame. Is you have the Roman Empire. How many of you have seen Gladiator? Anybody seen Gladiator? I think Gladiator did a pretty good job of capturing first century Rome. Like, that's kind of what it was like. And there was the in-group, and there was the out-group. And the in-group was the Roman citizens. And they had the favor of the emperor. And if you didn't have the favor of the emperor, what could the emperor do to you? Be a thumbs up or a thumbs down? He could kill you. Like that was his prerogative. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is, Timothy, the worst thing that can happen to you or to any Christian for following Christ is that the emperor can have you killed. But guess what? It doesn't matter because you have been given immortality. You have been given life. And as soon as you are killed, you will be raised to new life. Isn't that awesome? And yet how many of us still go through life with fear and shame? It's not just us. Like this has been a struggle for Christians. This is why it's in the Bible. And this is what Timothy was struggling with. And this is why Paul wrote this letter to him and exhorted him. But now we want to know, why does God do that? Why does God create this new reality? And what Paul says is not because of our works. Because I think there's some of you in here, if we're honest with ourselves, you're kind of working under the assumption that if my good works outweigh my bad works, just just got to get that 51%, then when I stand before God, I'll have an argument. Like, look, I was better than I was bad. And that's not the way the gospel works. Here's what the bad news of the gospel is that every single person in here is more miserable than you even thought you were. You're worse than you think you are. We are not only sinners because we sin, but we're sinners because we were born into sin. Like, that's just who we are. We are sinners, and it's ugly. But God didn't, We don't need to work for it. In fact, we can't work for it. Paul says it's not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Timothy, the reason you'll be part of the kingdom, the reason you'll be raised from the dead to immortality and life, the reason you'll have all this is not because of your works. So lose the sense that you have to work for it. Lose the sense, modern day culture, of this idea of shame because of what you've done. Guess what? God knows what you've done. And even though he knows what you've done, guess what he did? He saved you anyway. He extended his grace to you, to all of us. So that moment when we're saved, that wasn't a surprise to God. Before the foundations of the earth, he loved you. And he knew he was going to do this. He knew he was going to display his mercy and grace through the death, burial, resurrection of his son Jesus for our salvation. There is nothing any of us can do in here to earn God's love. If you're like really good this week, like you're motivated by this sermon, you're like, I'm not going to be driven by fear. I'm going to be driven by the gospel. And you live awesome this week. Next week, God doesn't love you more than he loves you today. Like, that's not the way it works. That's not the gospel. The gospel is because he loves us, he he loves us. Like, that's it. It's his grace. It's freely given. He gives it to us. That's why he created this new reality, because he wants us to live in this new reality. He wants us to be, he gives us an opportunity to be a part of this story and this mission that he's given us. And even though we know all this, I mean, think about Timothy for a second. Timothy traveled with Paul. Timothy was mentored by Paul. Timothy was taught by Paul. He heard him preach day after day, week after week. And yet Timothy is still susceptible to be driven by fear and shame. You think we're better than Timothy? I don't. I think we are tempted to be driven by fear and shame. And so this is why Paul has to write, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Timothy, it's real. Jesus was raised from the dead. You know that he was raised from the dead. It's real. So don't be ashamed of that. Imagine you're in college. And in college, you take this final exam. You're just doing well in the class. 
you study for this exam, you know that you're going to ace this exam. And you go in and take the test, and like you knew everything on that exam. Like you feel so confident about what you know on that exam that you leave like ace that thing. And you get an email from the professor a couple days later, and he says, hey, I'd like to uh, see you about the final exam. And your sense like, well, I wonder why he wants to see me, but I sort of feel like I aced it. Maybe he's going to congratulate me on being the highest grade in the class, and you're just sort of feeling good about yourself. I tend to be more optimistic like that. <laughs> so you go in, and you sit down with the professor, and he says, hey, just, you did really well on the exam. In fact, it was the highest grade in the class, but I think he cheated. And deep down, you know in your heart, like, you did not cheat. Like, you were honest. You did everything. And so the professor begins to question you with a lot of stuff that was on that exam. And it becomes clear after talking with him for 20, 30 minutes that you knew everything. Like, you had internalized it. You knew this stuff. And he apologizes and said, well, there was a group of students who we caught cheating. And they were the only ones who had a grade close to yours. And so I just... It kind of felt like you might have been part of that group. And you leave, and you're feeling so good because you knew deep down your conviction was, I didn't cheat. I did well on this exam. And that's what Paul telling Timothy. Timothy, you know. You've seen the power of God as we've gone on these missionary journeys. You've seen people come to Christ. You know that Jesus was raised from the dead. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And if you are put in the shame crowd if the culture around you tries to put you in that shame crowd and not honor you, remember God has flipped the scale. And you will be honored by God for holding to the gospel. And this is what motivates Paul. Well, let me get what motivates Paul. Yep, yep. Let's go here. He says, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This is, why, this is what motivates Paul. This is what gets Paul going. And now if we go back to that, we're tempted not just to be ashamed of the gospel, but maybe even more so in our culture, we're tempted to be associated with those who might be ashamed of the, or might be shamed because of the gospel. Remember, Paul was a prisoner. Paul was put in prison. Paul says, like, everybody in Asia abandoned me. But don't abandon me, Timothy. Just like you know for certain the gospel, this is the gospel that I preach. This is what I've been entrusted with. Don't be ashamed of me. It's okay to be identified with those who culture shames. That's the gospel. Those who believe and follow Jesus Christ, those, don't be ashamed of those people. Sometimes we find ourselves being, like we'd rather be identified with the cool people, with the successful people, rather than the people who are following Christ. And what Paul says is don't be ashamed of the gospel and don't be ashamed of those who are living according to the gospel. So, though we're tempted and susceptible to being driven by fear and shame, we don't have to be. And the reason we don't have to be Paul gives us last. He says, because of the power of God. So he says uh, in verse 8, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And then in verse 14, he says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted you. So share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God. If we're not ashamed of the gospel... Timothy, if you identify with me and you identify with the risen Christ, you sort of hold him up as king rather than the emperor of Rome, you're going to have some problems. And you're probably going to suffer for it. But guess what? You can endure the suffering by the power of God. Where we live, we just, we suffer embarrassment. Getting back to that kind of shame scale, like we're ashamed sometimes because we're Christians. Like I remember the first beach baptism that I went to at OCF. So it's 19 years ago. Go down to the beach, and Margie actually wanted to sing music. I was like, seriously? We're going to sing out here? Like, there's other people around who aren't part of our group. <laughs> and then, like, we go, and we actually do 
sort of gave a little message on the meaning of baptism, and if you remember, Duke was loud. I'm like, other people are going to hear you, Duke. I'm going to keep it down a little bit. <laughs> and we go down to the water, and we baptize, and there was just a little bit of kind of angst, a little bit of shame. Like, what are people down on the beach going to think about this group that's singing worship songs and preaching? And for the last 18 years, it's one of the highlights of my year. I look forward to going down there. In fact, like two years ago, I think it was, there was a woman who saw what we were doing, heard the message, and got baptized that night. It's like, that's awesome. That's why we go down there and do it is not just for people to proclaim Christ that they've been died with him and raised to new life with him, but it's also a witness to those around us. There should be no shame in that. In fact, it works the other way too. The last 19 years of pastoring, I've seen a lot of people who have proclaimed Christ, proclaim that they've been saved, that they've been forgiven of their sins, and they don't take that next step of baptism. I think there's a little pride, maybe even a little shame of getting dunked in front of the family or whatever it might be. And eventually they sort of drift away from the church. Eventually they sort of drift away from Christ. Maybe it's the shame that they never quite get over. And that's why it's so important for us to honor those who do those things. Those who follow Christ, those we honor. Because we're all susceptible to that fear and shame. But we don't suffer like other people in the world. I was just in uh, Atlanta and the Uber driver that took me uh, to the airport, and it was kind of a long ride, and he had a bit of an accent, and so I asked him, I said, so where are you from? And he said, Nigeria. And I said, oh, Nigeria. I go, what, how come you came to America? Or no, when he said Nigeria, my immediate thought was, I know a lot of Christians from Nigeria, but I also know that Nigeria has Muslims. And so it's almost like you're either Christian or Muslim from Nigeria. And so that's what I asked him. I said, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. And then I said, so what brought you to America? And he said, well, have you heard of Boko Haram? And I went, oh, yeah. Like, I had totally forgotten that Boko Haram was in Nigeria, that that had been a part of it. And he said, yeah, my family lost everything, and we had some friends here, and so we came here. He came, he came first and was able to get his wife and his children here as well. That's suffering for Christ. Are those the kind of people that we want to identify with, that we want to be a part of, that we want to include in what we're doing? It's like, yes, that's what Paul says. There's somebody who's willing to suffer. How can they do it? By the power of God. They don't do it themselves. Think of uh, Peter. You remember a moment in Peter's life when Peter was ashamed? Yeah. As Jesus was arrested and Jesus is on trial and a little girl little girl comes to Peter, says, hey, I, weren't you with that guy? Peter's like, darn right I was. Is that what he said? No. <laughs> Peter's like, I, I don't know that man. I don't know what he's doing. He does it three times. He denies her or denies that he knows Jesus. And then Jesus dies and then the gospel happens. He's raised from the dead. And all of a sudden, Peter and the other followers are like, this is real. And they go, and they're praying in the upper room, and what comes upon them in that upper room is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, what does Peter do? He gets bold, and he proclaims the gospel. No longer is he ashamed of it. Why? Because the power of God. And the Holy Spirit, the next part that Paul says, he says, by the, Holy Spirit, be, uh, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. That when we become, when we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, God's Spirit indwells us. And now we are empowered to bear witness. Specifically, what Paul is telling Timothy is to guard the good deposit entrusted to you. That good deposit that's entrusted to you is the word of God. It's not just the gospel. It's the scriptures that have been passed down. And I like the way that one guy has described it as like an outline. Like we've been given an outline and we have to hold firm to that outline and we cannot manipulate it or take anything away from that outline. Those are the scriptures. But we're 
we're free and encouraged to apply that outline, to apply those scriptures to our different cultures. It's why it could be relevant and preached in the first century in Rome and why it can be preached in the 21st century in the South Bay. But that outline, we cannot change. We've been entrusted with that. And unfortunately, in America today, there's a lot of people who are removing pieces of that outline. Sexual ethics are very clear in Scripture, and we just want to totally remove that from what the Scriptures say. That's, we don't have that freedom. We've been entrusted with something, and you think, man, that is hard. Talk about shame. It's holding up some of the things that Scripture talks about. How can we do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says. That's what Paul gives to Timothy. Now, the way Paul ends the passage is Paul gives us an example of three people. And I'd like you to look in your Bibles. In verse 15, Paul gives the example of three people, two who fell away, two who were driven by fear and shame, and one who was driven by the gospel and the power of God. Verse 15, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So the first two negative examples, Phygelus and Hermogenes, here are two people driven by fear and shame, and they walk away from the gospel, and they walk away from Paul. Paul says, they're out. They've walked away. The fear and the shame of being associated with the gospel message and with Paul, who's probably in prison at this time. If not in prison at this time, he's just out of prison. And rather than be associated with the gospel and with Paul, they walk away from the faith. That's what being driven by fear and shame will do. But then he spends two verses holding up a positive example. Onesiphorus, he says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of him, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me, May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you will know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Onesiphorus knows the gospel is true, and he wants to be identified with Paul, who holds to and is preaching the gospel. And so when he gets to Rome, he doesn't do what many of us do, right? Hey, I'm going to be in Atlanta this week. I'll look you up. You have no intention of looking that person up when you get to Atlanta. But it's a nicety. You find excuses not to have to take the time to go visit that person. What does it say about Onesiphorus? It says, when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. Like he had to go find the prison that Paul is in, which isn't like prisons today. It's like house arrest. And he had to go find Paul. There's not the internet where you can do a search for prisoner Paul and go see where he is. Like he had to to be very intentional and work hard to go find Paul. And when he found Paul, he refreshed him and he spent time with him. Like talk about identifying with somebody who is shameful in the Roman culture. He goes and spends time with him, probably brings him stuff, provides for him because in prison you had to be supported by others. But Onesiphorus knew the power of God. And Paul says, because he knows the power of God, because he's driven by the gospel, one day when the judgment day of the Lord comes, he's going to stand before the Lord and be rewarded. He's going to look forward to the day when God comes back because he's going to be granted mercy because he didn't run away from the gospel. He didn't run away from me. In fact, he supported me. One of the best things we got going here at OCF is Denny and Mimi O'Keefe. Denny and Mimi helped plant OCF. He's the red-haired guy that stands at the door and says hi to everybody if you know him. He's one of our elders. Uh, many of you don't know that Denny is an Onesiphorus. It's a terrible name. <laughs> Denny goes and visits people in jail and people in prison, and he has to be very intentional about it. Like he had to go through the process of getting business cards that said he was a pastor at OCF so that they would let him visit some of these people. 
That's not a short visit. Sometimes he's gone up to prison, which is in the Fresno area. A lot of times it's weekly visits to, uh, I think it's the county jail that's up in Santa Clarita up there by Magic Mountain. And Denny does this because those are brothers in Christ who are there. And he doesn't mind being associated with them. He doesn't mind sitting across from them in a glass window and talking with them. And what one of them in particular told me was that Denny was the only guy who came to visit him while he was in there. No family members ever came to see him, but Denny went there every week. That's somebody who's driven by the gospel and the power of God. That's the example that Paul holds up and says, you don't care about honor and shame in your culture. Care about honor that God gives you and that God will give you if you stay faithful to the gospel or driven by the gospel, which is really just allowing the power of God to work through you. May we be a church who honors what God honors, driven by the gospel, knowing that we have the power of God in us. Let's pray.